If you think you know the story of Harry Potter, think again. In today's iceberg, we're going to be covering all of the cut ideas, storylines, and more that didn't make it out of the first draft. From characters that never saw the light of day, like a secret know-it-all Weasley cousin that rivaled Hermione, to the deaths of main characters that would have rivaled Game of Thrones in shock factor. Before we dive in, take a second and click the subscribe button. Without you, there is no vault. I'm on a mission to make it to 10,000 subscribers, and you're an important part of that journey. It's free to subscribe, and it brings you more videos straight from the vault. Without further ado, this is the Harry Potter Secret Plots Iceberg Explained. As usual, we'll start off our journey at level one. Potter Betrayer The story of the Potter's murder is a tragedy, betrayed by someone who was once considered a friend, so much so that he was entrusted with their location through the use of a Fidelius charm. Peter Pettigrew gave away the Potter's location to Voldemort. If you don't know the ins and outs of the Fidelius charm, let me briefly summarize. In a nutshell, you have a secret and a secret keeper. That secret keeper, through what is described by Professor Flitwick as an immensely complex spell, seals the secret within their soul, making it impossible for anyone else to know without the secret keeper voluntarily telling them. From Flitwick, quote, As long as the secret keeper refused to speak, you know who could search the village where Lily and James were staying for years and never find them, not even if he had his nose pressed up against their sitting room window, end quote. In this case, that secret was the location of the Potters, so Peter betrayed the Potters, essentially choosing himself over them. You see this in The Prisoner of Azkaban when Pettigrew is confronted by Sirius Black years after the incident. Quote, Sirius, what could I have done, says Peter Pettigrew? The Dark Lord, he has weapons you can't imagine. I was scared, Sirius. I was never brave like you and Remus and James. He who must not be named forced me. Don't lie, bellowed Black. You were his spy. He... He was taking over everywhere, gasped Pettigrew. W what was there to be gained by refusing him? He would have killed me, Sirius. End quote. But what if that wasn't always the case? J.K. Rowling, as any good writer does, meticulously plans out her plot lines and arcs, sometimes going back and scrapping them entirely. That's probably why we'll never see another Game of Thrones book, if we're being honest. But her original story did not involve Peter Pettigrew at all. In fact, it didn't even involve a magical betrayal. Instead, a horrible muggle is the one that betrays the location of the Potters to Voldemort. Here's her description from the original version. Quote, There were so many different versions of the first chapter of Philosopher's Stone, and the one I finally settled on is not the most popular thing I've ever written. Lots of people have told me that they found it hard work compared to the rest of the book. The trouble with that chapter was, as so often happens in a Harry Potter book, I had to give a lot of information, yet conceal even more. There were various versions of scenes in which you actually saw Voldemort entering Godric's Hollow and killing the Potters, and in early drafts of these, a muggle betrayed their whereabouts. As the story evolved, however, and Pettigrew became the traitor, this horrible muggle vanished." End quote. In fact, when explaining in even more detail about the original chapters of Philosopher's Stone, J.K. Rowling actually told us about some of the other interesting places that the Potters lived. Quote, The very, very earliest drafts of the first chapter of Philosopher's Stone have the Potters living on a remote island, Hermione's family living on the mainland, her father spotting something that resembles an explosion out at sea and sailing out in a storm to find their bodies in the ruins of their house. I can't remember now why I thought this was a good idea, but I clearly recognized that it wasn't fairly early on, because the Potters were relocated to Godric's Hollow for all subsequent drafts, end quote. I thought this one was interesting. I'm sure it was a very early draft, as she mentions, but I can't help but wonder if this home on a remote island ended up transferring and showing up in many other ideas throughout the series. The Dursley's Hut on the Rock seems like an almost one-to-one -one lift from the original Potter's house, albeit a darker, drearier version, maybe. Potters Stole the Stone Speaking of the Potters' origins, there is also a really interesting plotline revolving around their involvement with the Philosopher's Stone. As you'll recall from the series that made it to print, James and Lily Potter don't really have any involvement with the Philosopher's Stone at all, 
The only reason they might be mentioned in the same breath is because of the riches they left for Harry and Gringotts, which also happened to be the place where the stone was being stored, in Vault 713. I do wonder who this vault actually belonged to. I would assume either Dumbledore or Nicholas Flamel, but I don't really think there's an explicit answer. It also makes me wonder what other kinds of crazy items are being stored in Gringotts. If there's enough material about it, I might have to make it into another video. Anyways, so we know that the finished plotline involved Dumbledore guarding the Philosopher's Stone in an attempt to keep it out of Voldemort's hands, but that wasn't always the case. J.K. Rowling kept many, many handwritten notes of the stories she wrote, and sometimes we get a glimpse of them. This one in particular reveals a plotline that involves the Potters at the center of a heist. I'll read the transcript below. There are a few parts that are scratched out, but the general idea is there. Also, note that Flamel is actually already dead in this version, unlike the finished story, where he agrees to die after Voldemort almost gets the stone at the end of the book. Quote, So this Flamel bloke found the stone, said Ron. No, he made it, said Harry. He was an alchemist, which means someone who turns base metals into gold, said Hermione. She had that old, proving, I know more than everyone else look on her face. The other two noticed. Of course, I read about this in Alchemy, Ancient Art, and Science by, scratched out, Argo Pyrites. I missed that one myself, muttered Ron. And, of course, it's some of the most difficult magic you can do. And you end up not just with pure gold, but also with a funny stone thing. Which is what I'm on about, said Harry. The Philosopher's Stone, yes. And it works, too. Scratched out. It kept Nicholas Flamel and his wife alive for about 500 years. What? I know, said Harry, but it's true. He was spotted at the opera in Paris in 1762, and he was born back in 13-something, scratched out. Ron whistled. But he's dead now, he asked. Of course, said Harry. Someone stole his stone so he couldn't make any more elixir of life, could he? It takes a while to make another stone, and by that time, I suppose, he was just too old to live without his elixir until a new stone was ready. And now I'll tell you something else really weird that I haven't told you up till now. The stone was found in my parents' safe at Gringotts Bank. But instead of the interested noises Harry had expected, Ron and Hermione simply stared at him, scratched out. What? said Harry. Ron cleared his throat, opened his mouth to speak, but shut it again. What? said Harry. Well, Harry, said Hermione, I mean, you mean what? He stared at them both as they shuffled their feet and tried not to look him in the eye. You don't think, he said suddenly and angrily, that my parents stole the stone? Um, said Ron. Look, said Harry furiously, that's like saying they murdered Flamel. Oh, Harry, we never thought. Not much you didn't, he said. I don't know how it got there, but the stone wasn't put there by them. Right, said Ron quickly, scratched out. I'm sure you're right. There must be an obvious explanation, said Hermione, scratched out. Harry wasn't at all convinced that they meant it, but at the moment, the bell rang, which put an end to the conversation, end quote. We're obviously only getting a tiny fraction of a story here, so there's a ton of unknowns. I doubt the story in J.K. Rowling's head wouldn't have been as simple as the Potters stole the stone. I'm guessing it would have had something to do with Dumbledore placing the stone in the Potter's vault for some reason, but it does make you wonder how much of the story Rowling had planned out, and at what point she had puzzled it all together. I feel like as we walk through some of these plot lines, especially in the earlier books, you get a sense that maybe her original timeline was much shorter, that instead of seven books, she might have finished it in three or four. But I'm just speculating here. We're only two in, and we've got a ways to go. Early Names all right, the last two have been pretty in-depth. Let's do a couple of quick hitters. Namely, no pun intended, some original names. There are two name changes that stick out in the world of Harry Potter revisions, and I think stand as a testament to the writing and editing process. Now, these are only two, so I know there's a ton, but we'll just leave it at these two. The first name change is that of Draco Malfoy. When you look at Draco, or really any of his family, there just isn't any other name that comes to mind besides Malfoy, 
It really seems to me like the perfect name to match their stuck-up and somewhat evil nature, and their semi-genocidal beliefs. You can actually break their name into its etymology to understand a little better. Mal is derived from the French word for bad or evil, and it's probably pronounced like mal or something. I don't know. I'm not French. Well, foi, 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 in French, I, maybe it is foi. It means faith. So Malfoy basically means bad faith, which really does seem to fit quite well, specifically for Draco, though somehow he comes out the other end not imprisoned. But his surname was not always Malfoy. Some notable alternatives that J.K. Rowling had in mind included Spungen, or Spungen, I'm not sure how you would have pronounced it, or Spinx. Let me know your thoughts on these. Spungen, Spungen, it sounds dirty to me for some reason, and Spinx sounds a little too playful, but maybe it's reminding me of Tonks. I guess the Tonks family is related to the Malfoys, so it's entirely possible that somehow it went from Spinx to Tonks. Regardless, I'm glad we ended up with Malfoy at the final version. One other name was that of Hermione Granger. We're all familiar with Granger. It's hard to imagine her as being anything else, but that wasn't always the case. Originally, J.K. Rowling had planned to call her Hermione Puckle, which is interesting, but there were two reasons that came to mind as to why she might have shied away from Puckle as a last name. First of all, it would have meant that Hermione would have the same initials as Harry Potter, which was probably enough of a reason to change it on its own. But the second reason for me was that Puckle sounds a little too whimsical for a muggle family of dentists. For whatever reason, Granger just sounds like so much more of a dentist name. No offense to any of you dentists out there. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I need to schedule a dentist appointment. Chamber of Secrets Crash Landing As I was looking up this topic, I came to a realization that should have been in my previous videos about changes made in the movies. I kept searching for the Black Lake, only to find J.K. Rowling consistently refer to it as the Great Lake, but at the same time, the book seems to refer to it exclusively as the lake, with no great or black prefix at all. These changes are always so interesting to me, because what was the point? Why make such a tiny change for the movie? What's the point of calling it the Black Lake in one place and the Great Lake in another and just the lake in a third? I don't really get it. Regardless, there's more to this than just the name of the lake, which is actually a Scottish loch, which is also a lake, if it's located in Scotland. I'm telling you, my Google search history while writing these videos is a roller coaster. So, the crash. If you remember Ron and Harry's magical car ride to get to Hogwarts in their second year, you'll also recall their crash landing of the Ford Anglia? An Anglia? I don't know. I'm not British. Anyway, they crash this into the Whomping Willow. The car promptly kicks the boys out of the driver and passenger seat and drives off on its own. It does, of course, later return to save them from death by spiders, but it again returns to the forest. We'll circle back to that later in the iceberg. In the original draft of The Chamber of Secrets, their crash was actually going to be much different, and would have had much larger implications on the magical world as a whole. Here's J.K. Rowling discussing the original plotline. Quote, in the original draft of the Chamber of Secrets, I had Harry and Ron crash into the lake in Mr. Weasley's Ford Anglia and meet the mer people there for the first time. At that time, I had a vague notion that the lake might lead to other places and that the mer people might play a larger role in later books than they did, so I thought that Harry ought to be introduced to both at this stage. However, the Whopping Willow provided a more satisfying, less distracting crash, and served a later purpose in Prisoner of Azkaban as well. The Great Lake, which is really a Scottish lock, apparently freshwater and landlocked, never did develop as a portal to other seas or rivers, although the appearance of the Durmstrang ship from its depths in Goblet of Fire hints at the fact that if you are traveling by an enchanted craft, you might be able to take a magical shortcut to other waterways. End quote. Here's the account of the ship actually arriving to Hogwarts via some magical underwater transportation method. Quote, Slowly, magnificently, the ship rose out of the water, gleaming in the moonlight. It had a strange skeletal look about it, 
as though it was a resurrected wreck, and the dim, misty lights shimmering at its portholes looked like ghostly eyes. And finally, with a great sloshing noise, the ship emerged entirely, bobbing on the turbulent water, and it began to glide toward the bank. End quote. I can imagine that in writing a series as sprawling as Harry Potter, one of the most difficult parts would be choosing which magical objects and plot lines to include, and which to cut. What's surprising to me is that it seems like a rather large component of the book that was cut. I have no idea what kind of greater role the Mer people would have played in a later book. It's hard to imagine Voldemort having to fight a bunch of Mer people, but stranger things have happened, I guess. Nearly Headless Backstory Something that seemed to have a much larger part in the books than in the movies was the presence of ghosts and spirits. We had quite a few in the first movie. We had Moaning Myrtle in the Chamber of Secrets, and I'm sure there were more after that, but I can't think of any major plot lines or stories in the movies where the ghosts and spirits of Hogwarts played any real meaningful role. But there were also other ghostly bits that were cut from the movies, including the Death Day Party. In the books, this party of ghosts that Harry's invited to attend functions as a way to introduce us to Moaning Myrtle. The movies instead take a more direct path, having the gang find her on their own in the bathroom. But on to the main ghost of this topic, Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Pompington, also known as Nearly Headless Nick. I think I got that pronunciation. Nearly Headless Nick was executed back in 1492, but the exact circumstances of his execution were not described in great detail. There is a scene in the books in Prisoner of Azkaban where Nick reenacts his beheading, but to my knowledge, he never really explains how he got there in the first place. J.K. Rowling, on the other hand, had other plans, originally giving him a self-written poem or ballad to explain his backstory. I'll let Nick's words do the honors. Quote, it was a mistake any wizard could make, who was tired and caught on the hop. One piffling error, and then, to my terror, I found myself facing the chop. Alas, for the eve when I met Lady Grieve, a strolling the park in the dusk. She was of the belief I could straighten her teeth. Next moment she sprouted a tusk. I cried through the night that I'd soon put her right, but the process of justice was lax. They brought out the block, though they'd mislaid the rock, where they usually sharpened the axe. Next morning at dawn, with a face most forlorn, the priest said, try not to cry. You can come just like that, no, you won't need a hat, and I knew that my end must be nigh. The man in the mask, who would have had the sad task of cleaving my head from my neck, said, Nick, if you please, will you please get to your knees, and I turned to a gibbering wreck. This may sting a bit, said the cack-handed twit, as he swung the axe up in the air. But oh, the blunt blade, no difference it made, my head was still definitely there. The axeman he hacked, and he whacked, and he thwacked. It won't be long, he assured me, but quick it was not, and the bone-handed clot took forty-five goes till he floored me. And so I was dead, but my faithful old head, it never saw fit to desert me. It still lingers on, and that's the end of my song. And now, please clap, or you'll hurt me. End quote. So, he was essentially a terrible wizard dentist, and instead of fixing the teeth of a wealthy aristocrat woman, he gave her a tusk instead. What's really interesting here, and something that isn't mentioned, is that at the point where Nick is practicing his magical dentistry, muggles and wizards are supposedly living in community. It wasn't until the International Statute of Wizarding Secrecy in 1692 where the two split, which implies that everyone could have known that Nick was a wizard, and since they killed him, it seems like they didn't give him a chance to remove the tusk from the woman either. So instead of letting the magical person try to remove the tusk, she would have chose to just execute him and then live the rest of her days with a tusk? He seems to have been executed the very next day, despite crying through the night that he would fix his mistake. I guess there could have been another wizard that could fix it for her, but anyway. I don't know about you, but when I see songs and books, I tend to sort of skip over them. I don't know what it is about them, but as soon as I see more than a few lines written in that way that songs are always typed out in books, my eyes just sort of 
glaze over them and pick up right after. I don't know. Maybe I'm alone there. I'm sure you'll roast me in the comments for that, but I'm just being honest with you all. And speaking of the honest truth, did you know that only 3% of you subscribe to this channel? 3%. If you're not subscribed, do me a favor and click the button. Okay, good. Thank you. Now on to level two. Flipped order. You may think you know the order of the phoenix, and you may think you know Dumbledore's army, but what if I told you you had it all flipped upside down and reversed? If you look at scans of J.K. Rowling's original notes and outline, she consistently refers to a group that Harry is starting as the Order of the Phoenix, not as the Dumbledore's army, something that wouldn't become the case until a later version of the story. She also had a section titled, quote, D.A., which one can only assume is a reference to Dumbledore's army. Within that column, she refers to characters and events that will eventually associate with the Order of the Phoenix. I, for one, think this is an example that shows the importance of multiple drafts in the version of a story. This is basically the whole point of this video, is to show what J.K. Rowling's original ideas were and what they became. In a lot of these examples, you can see hints of storylines that were changed and adapted to fit other threads. Most of the time, I think these were good changes. Dumbledore's army and the Order of the Phoenix, for example, I think are much better and appropriate when associated with the groups in the final version of the story. The idea of Dumbledore calling his group of adult resistance fighters after himself it seems a little self-absorbed and in many ways the antithesis of what Dumbledore always wanted. He may have been a cunning strategist and rather shrewd with the way he regarded human life. In many ways, he was always thinking about the greater good, not the lives of individual witches and wizards. I mean, he even sacrificed himself all in an effort to catch Voldemort in a trap. So the idea that he would name the group after himself seems childish. All the more reason that the name fits better with Harry's group. Switching Dumbledore's group of adults to the Order of the Phoenix is not only a more refined name, one that wouldn't immediately give away their allegiance and attentions, but it also makes more sense from a literary perspective. It's obviously a reference to Fox, but it also represents a rebirth of wizarding society, and even through the death of many of its members, it could be reborn in the future. On the other hand, when you look at Harry's group of student fighters, it makes quite a bit more sense for them to call themselves Dumbledore's army, especially at the point in the story when it's formed. Harry, at this point in the story, does not have all the information. He still believes Dumbledore is a sort of pure savior figure and knows nothing about the sacrifice he's being groomed into being. So to eventually settle on Dumbledore's army after Ginny's suggestion makes much more sense. And not only do they choose it to mock the Ministry of Magic and frighten them into believing that Dumbledore is going to attempt some sort of coup, but also, I have no doubt, because of Harry's, and most of the members, undying loyalty to Dumbledore. Arthur Weasley's death. Despite Harry Potter not quite being the same when it comes to main character deaths as something like Game of Thrones, there were still quite a few memorable send-offs that left all of us in anguish. There's of course Dumbledore, but that's kind of just part of the plot in my memory. Sirius Black's death is probably one that fans will remember the most after Dumbledore, and then there's, of course, the tragic deaths of Dobby, Cedric Diggory, Snape, Hedwig, Tonks and Lupin, and there are others that hurt more. Think, for example, of George Weasley's death in The Deathly Hallows. You know, I'm just kidding, I'm sure some of you jumped out of your chairs there. Fred's death was such a sad moment, and it barely even got that much attention in the books, much less so in the movies. But there was originally going to be one more on this list, in particular an additional member of the Weasley family. To set the stage, you'll remember that after a few failed attempts at killing Harry, Voldemort set out to hear the prophecy for himself. And ahead of his eventual visit and duel with Dumbledore, he sent his snake Nagini. Harry then gets a front row seat to the event where Nagini finds a sleeping Arthur Weasley guarding the prophecy. She attacks Arthur and lands him in St. Mungo's. A side note here, because I don't remember, why did he send Nagini in the first place? Was it like a scouting mission? I don't really know why it was necessary when a couple of Death Eaters probably could have handled the job. Also, 
I feel like I need an indicator when I'm looking for input from you out there. I can research a lot, but I can't always find every answer. Something to think about for the future videos. Anyways, so Arthur gets attacked and is sent to the hospital to recover from his injuries. It's clear that those injuries are quite severe, but most people don't know how deadly they almost became. As a fun fact, you'll recall that one of his attending wizard physician healers even recommended trying muggle stitches, which simply dissolved. But I found it fitting for a man that loves muggle technology. Arthur's wounds almost ended up killing him, and according to J.K. Rowling, one of the main reasons they didn't is because it would have ruined Ron as a character. From an interview in 2007, when asked about how the story would have been different if Arthur was killed, J.K. Rowling responded with the following. Quote, I think they would have been very different, and it's part of the reason why I chose my mind. By turning Ron into half of Harry, in other words, by turning Ron into someone who had suffered the loss of a parent, I was going to remove the Weasleys as a refuge for Harry, and I was going to necessarily remove a lot of Ron's humor. That's part of the reason why I didn't kill Arthur. I wanted to keep Ron intact. A lot of Ron's humor comes from his insensitivity and his maturity to be honest about Ron. And Ron finally, I think, you see, grows up in this book. He's the last of the three to reach what I consider adulthood. And he does it then when he destroys the Horcrux and faces those things. So that's part of the reason, end quote. So Arthur gets saved for the sake of Ron, something that we're bound to circle back on later in the iceberg. Wink, wink. Don't skip ahead. Professor Trokar, the Vampire. Here's an idea that I covered in the fan theory video I made a couple weeks back. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, go check it out here. Basically, in the fan theory version of this topic, fans had long speculated that Snape was actually a vampire, or at least was somehow related to a vampire, or had been a vampire in previous drafts. Regardless of how exactly it worked, fans thought that there was a vampire involved. I would guess it had a lot to do with the popularity of Twilight at the time, I think it came out in the late 2000s, so I'm sure there were a lot of Harry Potter fan theories flying around at that time. But what's interesting is that this theory was not completely off base. However, it's unclear if fans just got lucky with a theory, or if somehow the original idea found its way from a first draft into parts of the finished story. You see, J.K. Rowling did actually have some initial notes that talked about a vampire professor. His name was Professor Trokar. And while he didn't have a subject assigned to him, he was, in fact, a vampire. From J.K. Rowling, quote, Looking back through my earliest notebooks, however, I found that one of my earliest lists of staff, there was a subjectless vampire teacher that I had forgotten, called Trokar. A Trokar is a sharply pointed shaft inserted into arteries or cavities to extract bodily fluids, so I think it was a rather good name for a vampire. Evidently, I did not think of him much as a character, though, because he disappears fairly early on in my notes. For a long time, there was a persistent fan rumor that Snape might be a vampire. While it is true that he has an unhealthy pallor, and is sometimes described as looking like a large bat in his long black cloak, he never actually turns into a bat. We meet him outside the castle by daylight, and no corpses with puncture marks in their necks ever turn up at Hogwarts. In short, Snape is not a revamped Trokar. End quote. What's always interesting to me is the creative process and why this character was removed in the first place. She did, of course, keep werewolves in the series, and there are vampires that exist in the wizarding world, but J.K. Rowling had made comments that she thought the character type was overused in media and literature, so decided not to include them. It's still a little surprising to me, because... Harry Potter did come out before Twilight, so I don't remember all that many vampire movies and books coming out at that point in time. There were and have always been plenty of zombie movies, but I'm not sure about vampires. It does make me wonder, if she somehow were able to rewrite the entire series, what would she change now? She obviously had to continue to expand on the world through additional writings, the Magical Beast movies, the upcoming HBO show... But what would she change if she could truly start from scratch? Would there still be werewolves? Would she instead decide to include a vampire or two in the story? What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. Hermione's sister. <laughs> 
In an interesting twist on the classic trio, apparently the group of Harry, Ron, and Hermione was not always meant to be just that, a trio. J.K. Rowling mentioned in an interview in 2004, when asked about whether or not we would get to know the Grangers better, quote, I always planned that Hermione would have a younger sister, but she never made an appearance, and somehow it feels like it might be too late now, end quote. Mind you, this was in 2004, so between the release of Order of the Phoenix in 2003 and the release of Half-Blood Prince in 2005. Admittedly, I do think it would have been a little late to introduce a new Granger at this point in Book 6, if only so far as it would have been strange that Hermione hadn't mentioned her in the five school years that had already gone by. She doesn't talk a ton about her parents, but surely she would have talked about a sister, especially if her sister was going to end up being a witch. I do wonder if some muggles that had one magical child were more likely to have multiple magical children. It seems like that would be the case, and I can remember reading somewhere that J.K. Rowling said that the magical gene is dominant, although I'm not really sure how much she knows about genes anyway. One theory I saw mentioned a few times dealt with the way in which J.K. Rowling tends to write her stories. In many, many cases, a series of events or a relationship mirror one that happens at a different point in the story. The whole series, in fact, is set up in a way to be chiastic in nature. That is, if you're not aware, a structure in which early parts of a story mirror those in the later part. Parts in the middle mirror those that are closer to the middle on the opposite side. So think of book 1 and 7 pairing up, 2 and 6, 3 and 5, and 4 marking a middle point. Thematically, it makes a lot of sense, and the books definitely take a darker turn in book 4. So why do I bring this all up? Only to say that some suggestions were that Hermione's sister might have been a mirror to the relationship of Lily and Petunia Evans. That's Lily Potter's maiden name. Hermione obviously being the witch, and her sister potentially being a muggle. This could have potentially set up a mirror to Petunia and Lily in that it would have been a much more loving and caring sister relationship, rather than the estranged one that we see with Lily and Petunia. It could have been interesting, but I don't blame her for writing her out of the script by the time Half-Blood Prince came out. I don't think two books really would have been enough to include potentially important characters and close relationships at that point. Speaking of a chiastic nature, we're at the middle of this video, so before we drop down to level 3, why don't you take a chance and subscribe to the channel? We're making our way to 10,000 subs, and I'd love to have you along for the journey. While you click that button, let's dive deeper down to level 3. Ron's Death Okay, so I'm really going to start to build on what we've learned so far, and we're going to channel our inner J.K. Rowling here. So remember, I just told you about the chiastic structure. Let's look back just a few topics earlier, and you'll remember the almost death of Arthur Weasley. Now let's talk about one that actually would have had readers boycotting the series. The death of Ron Weasley. It actually sounds so crazy that I almost don't believe it was ever in her draft. Or at least, I wouldn't believe it if she hadn't mentioned it in an interview hosted by Daniel Radcliffe himself. Quote, Funnily enough, I planned from the start that none of the trio would die. Then midway through, which I think is a reflection of the fact that I wasn't in a very happy place, I started thinking I might polish one of them off, out of sheer spite. There, now you definitely can't have him anymore. But I think in my absolute heart of heart of hearts, although I did seriously consider killing Ron, I wouldn't have done it. End quote. I'm not totally sure what unhappy place she would have had to be in to consider killing off one of the main trio, but I have to imagine it was pretty bad. All that said, I'm not really sure what killing Ronoff would have accomplished. I suppose how he died would have mattered quite a bit. It almost certainly would have been for Harry, or in service of his battle with Voldemort, but I'm not quite sure what it would have accomplished. One potential idea I was thinking about as I was writing this script was thinking about all the mirroring components in the series. Maybe J.K. Rowling had intended for Ron to die in the final book, The Deathly Hallows, in a way that would have mirrored the first book. Perhaps Ron would have sacrificed himself as a part of the grand chess match between Voldemort and Dumbledore slash Harry, 
That would have mirrored the way that Ron sacrificed himself in the original game of Wizard's Chess back in the Philosopher's Stone, and could have, in fact, been an interesting way to kill him off. It would have put Hermione in a strange position, but maybe it would have finally opened the door for Harry and Hermione to end up together, rather than Harry and Ginny? Who knows? Mafalda Pruitt Speaking of characters that almost existed, first we had Hermione's almost sister that disappeared from existence, and now we have this mystery child, Mafalda Pruitt. J.K. Rowling did in fact describe Mafalda on her site a while back, and unlike Hermione's sister, it seems like Mafalda was pretty detailed. A lot of the plans J.K. Rowling had for Mafalda seemed to have made their way into the final story, just in a few different forms. In the words of J.K. Rowling, quote, Mafalda was the daughter of the second cousin who's a stockbroker mentioned in the Philosopher's Stone. This stockbroker would have been very rude to Mr. and Mrs. Weasley in the past, but now he and his muggle wife had inconveniently produced a witch. They came back to the Weasleys asking for their help in introducing her to wizarding society before she starts at Hogwarts. The Weasleys agreed to taking her for part of the summer, including the Quidditch World Cup, but regretted all this almost immediately. Mrs. Weasley suspected that Mafalda's parents simply wanted to get rid of her for a while, because she turns out to be the most unpleasant child Mrs. Weasley has ever met. End quote. So, what was Mafalda supposed to do? She was going to be quite a bit more than just an unpleasant child and random second cousin, which, as I'm looking this up right now and looking at these random charts of second cousins and third cousins twice removed, I think that would have made Mafalda a second cousin once removed for all the good that does. So, regardless, she's detailed as a distant cousin, but her role in the books was far from distant. Quote, Mafalda was supposed to convey certain information about the Death Eaters to Harry, Ron, and Hermione, because as a nosy, eavesdropping Slytherin who likes to impress, she does not keep her mouth shut when she overhears their sons and daughters talking. Unfortunately, however bright I made her, there were obvious limitations to what an 11-year-old closeted at school could discover, whereas Rita Skeeter, whom I've subsequently built up to fulfill Mafalda's function, was much more flexible, end quote. So Mafalda had a role that was almost entirely transferred over to Rita Skeeter, but did you catch the other part? Mafalda would have been a Slytherin. I think that's probably the most interesting aspect of her character. While she would not have been a Weasley, she would have been related to the Weasleys, and no Weasleys were ever sorted into Slytherin, or really any house other than Gryffindor. This could have been a really interesting twist on the story, as we're never really given any point of redemption for any of the Slytherin students. They are almost always portrayed as villains, and they never do anything good. Having a character, one related to the Weasleys no less, sorted into Slytherin, would have gone a long way to rehabilitate the house and make it something that wasn't synonymous with bad guy. The other part of Mafalda you have to remember is that she would have been introduced in Goblet of Fire as a first-year student, and as such, you'd really be stretching your imagination to accept all the feats that an 11-year-old might accomplish. I'll leave you with one other component to Mafalda that would have been really interesting, and might have been informed, even slightly, by the missing Granger sister. Quote, The best thing about Mafalda was that she was a match for Hermione. To the latter's horror, Mafalda was highly gifted and a real show-off, so that Hermione was torn between deploring the rule-breaking and longing to join in and beat her. End quote. Pyrites. We're on a roll with characters that didn't end up existing, so let's keep it going with one more. Labeled as an early supporter of Voldemort, potentially even a follower back when Death Eaters had a different name, the Knights of Walpurgis. Apparently there's some folklore around Walpurgis that I wasn't aware of. It's some old German folklore that I'm not really going to read too much about. Suffice to say it had something to do with witchcraft or religion and was a certain holiday that was celebrated. Anyways, I don't think that's super relevant. I'm just saying it was a kind of lame name for a gang. Walpurgis? Anyway. So, back to the missing character in question. Pyrites was a very earlier supporter of Voldemort that was cut from J.K. Rowling's drafts pretty early on, 
it seems that some of his roles were switched to different characters to fulfill his duties. Wormtail, for example, seems to be a prime example as a loyal servant that might have had similar responsibilities to pyrites. That said, it does appear from J.K. Rowling's description that he was much more suave than Wormtail, so I would guess that a lot of that got stripped out with the early drafts. Quote, Other drafts included a character by the name of Pyrites, whose name means fool's gold. He was a servant of Voldemort's and was meeting with Sirius in front of the Potter's house. Pyrites, too, had to be discarded, though I quite liked him as a character. He was a dandy and wore white silk gloves, which I thought might stain artistically with blood from time to time. End quote. So, interestingly, not only was he a right-hand man for Voldemort, he also would have opened the series, showing up to the scene of the crime at the Potter's house at the same time as Sirius Black. I'm not very clear what would have transpired there in front of the Potter's house. I can imagine Sirius definitely would have wanted to duel and seek revenge, so if he knew that Pyrites was a Death Eater, I'm sure that meeting would not have ended well. But it's also entirely possible that J.K. Rowling didn't really know how that part of the story was going to go either. She mentions that Pyrites was removed from the story pretty early on, so I doubt that all the details involving his character were polished. If anything, it does make me interested in seeing what this character would have been like. We see a lot of different Death Eaters, but most of them seem like misbehaving socialites, except for Bellatrix, of course. They come off as wealthy, racist people who also happen to kill people, but that sounds more like cult follower to me, listening to their leader. Pyrites, on the other hand, with the little we know about him, seems more like he could have been an opportunity to be a truly dark and twisted second-in-command for Voldemort, but I guess we'll never really see that. Mad-Eye Origins You will all, of course, remember Sybil Trelawney, the seer famous for divining the Chosen One prophecy. But from what I can find and remember, she wasn't actually all that great at fortune-telling. Instead, her skills seemed to be uncontrollable. But she wasn't always the only fortune-telling witch or wizard in the story. And at this point, you might be wondering how in the world this is going to connect to Mad-Eye Moody. But I'll get there. Stick with me. You see, J.K. Rowling talked about this in an early interview back in 2005. The interviewer was praising the fact that the books were being translated into Braille, and that blind children around the world would finally be able to read the books. J.K. Rowling then flipped this into an anecdote about a blind professor she had once included in an early draft of the story by the name of Mopsis. Whether it was supposed to be Mopsis or Mopsis, I'm not sure. Okay, I actually looked this up while recording, and as she says, it's based on some Greek mythology, so the pronunciation is actually Mopsu. I would have never guessed that. From that interview, quote, At one point, there was a blind character who went by the name of Mopsu. And I will let you look him up because there is a mythological connection there, but he sort of, that was a very early character, and he had the power of second sight. In other words, he was a bit like Professor Trelawney. He was a very, very early character. This was when I was drafting Philosopher's Stone. The reason I cut him was he was too good. As the story evolved, if there was somebody who could really do divination at the time that Harry was alive, it greatly diminished the drama of the story because someone out there knew what was going to happen. So that is why Mopsu went, and I've never really replaced him. Although I suppose Mad-Eye Moody had some of Mopsu characterization. He has one magical eye because he lost an eye in a fight with a Death Eater. So, good question. End quote. What isn't really clear is how much of Mad-Eye Moody's character was pulled from Mopsu's character. Was it just the eye, or were there actually character traits that were pulled from him as well? It is rather interesting that he gains an eye with some very unique and powerful seeing abilities. It might not be fortune-telling or divination of the future, but he is able to see things that most other magic doesn't allow. He sees Harry through the Cloak of Invisibility, for example, a feat that there aren't many other examples of, meaning that either the eye is quite powerful, even compared to a Deathly Hallow, or Harry's cloak is not all it's cracked up to be. 
Dumbledore is able to see through it with what seems to be a pretty simple spell, so that also has me questioning the cloak altogether, but maybe that's for a future plot hole video. But what I find really interesting is the literary techniques she's discussing, and how those informed which characters stayed in the story and which didn't. She's right, having a character that can see the future at will takes all of the tension out of the story. Harry would simply have to visit Mopsu before every battle for a little bit of guidance. Although, with the way time travel and prophecy works in Harry Potter, there wouldn't have been anything he could change even if he knew the future. So, it would have been a pretty anticlimactic visit to Mopsu. He would have just learned that he was going to win and then gone off to battle, I guess? Regardless, we see this type of decision-making from J.K. Rowling in a lot of these topics. There are more to come, but even in the items we've discussed so far, Mafalda, Arthur's death, even the way the Potters are betrayed, are all edited from the first draft to better aid in the narrative. And I think that's fascinating. I would have loved to see more notes about the use of the Cloak of Invisibility, as it's basically another way for J.K. Rowling to push the narrative forward in a way that removes Harry from the situation. He can sit and watch a conversation happen without being present in the scene, which allows the reader to be present in the scene that they otherwise shouldn't have been able to see. And just like Harry sitting there and observing something happen, if you're sitting here watching this video unfold, I'd suggest clicking that subscribe button. Go ahead, you can do it. Just a quick click. And with that, we're off and down to level four. Sorting process. Of all the changes that I've walked through in this video, I don't think there are any that better exemplify the importance of a creative process and of developing and critiquing ideas. The sorting hat, and the process associated with it, is likely one of the most recognizable aspects of the Harry Potter world. If you asked 100 people on the street to name a random scene from Harry Potter, I have no doubt that the sorting hat would rank pretty highly on there. It's a unique idea that kicks off the entire series with the acknowledgement that, yes, the world is dark, but also there's some fun and whimsy in it. But it wasn't always this way. In fact, by my count and the research that I did, the sorting process seems to have undergone no less than five changes from the first draft to the final sorting hat that we know and think of today. Quote, The sorting hat does not appear in my earliest plans for Hogwarts. I debated several different methods for sorting students because I knew from early on that there would be four houses, all with very different qualities, end quote. The first idea she mentions in an old post from 2015 was some sort of elaborate machine. For my American viewers, she's going to mention a Heath Robinson machine. Just replace that in your mind with Rube Goldberg. Quote, the first was an elaborate Heath Robinson-ish machine that did all kinds of magical things before reaching a decision, but I did not like it. It felt at once too complicated and too easy, end quote. This idea seems like she removed it pretty early on in the process, which on one hand, I do think is a bit of a shame. I can picture that machine working in my head, but I do think she's right in that it would have been too easy. It would have hidden all the workings of the sorting process behind some inscrutable machine. You wouldn't have been able to speak to the machine. It wouldn't have been a character in the same way as the sorting hat. Half of me wonders if this is the beginnings of the magical antics of the Weasley twins. The Rube Goldberg idea seems much more in line with the way that you would dispense candy rather than sort students. And next, the ideas started to narrow in. Quote, Next, I placed four statues of the four founders in the entrance hall, which came alive and selected students from the throng in front of them while the school watched. This was better, but still not quite right. End quote. Interestingly, this exact method seems to have been adopted for the students from Ilvermory, the wizarding school in Massachusetts. These founder statues are another fascinating approach, as unlike the first machine, there would have been potential for students to communicate with these statues and for them to act as characters. Although, I'm not sure we really would have wanted to hear much from Salazar Slytherin. We'll leave that one alone. Lastly, she started to close in on the final decision, but not before what seems to be a foray into desperation. Quote, Finally, I wrote a list of ways in which people can be chosen. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, short straws, chosen by team captains, names out of the hat, names out of a talking hat, putting on a hat, the sorting hat. 
end quote. I had also read during my research that part of the idea for the hat came from the fact that one of the founder statues, not sure which, would have been wearing a hat, and that there was a possibility that during the creative process, those four statues, those four founders, were distilled down into a single sorting statue that wore a wizard hat. Combine that with the idea of choosing a name from a hat, and once you remove the actual wizard from that equation, suddenly you have a whimsical talking hat with a mind of its own, and a stubborn streak. There were also a few other ideas she didn't mention in that original blog post, but they do appear in a handwritten draft. The first one of that draft includes a ghost court, which would have ostensibly been responsible for sorting the first-year students. In the same vein, there was also a selection committee, seemingly made of prefects. There were also methods like walking through a magical gateway or answering a question or riddle. Quote, there is a page of doodlings from which the sorting hat emerged. In the top part of that page are all the possible ways of sorting people I considered. A panel of ghosts or prefects, a magical gateway through which each person would have to pass, and so on. I also thought of drawing names out of a hat, which became the sorting hat. And at the bottom right corner, you can see my first drawing of the sorting hat, with the first four lines of its first ever song, end quote. All in all, I think she settled on the best option with the sorting hat. I can only imagine that millions of people have taken that sorting hat quiz online. So really, I think it resonated with everyone in a way that it became such a staple to the Harry Potter story. It's truthfully hard to imagine it happening any other way. Weasley Carr's Return This is probably the shortest entry on the list, because honestly, I wasn't able to find all that much information that confirmed the change. Supposedly, during some early drafts, potentially some that were not even written down, J.K. Rowling considered bringing the Weasley's sentient car back out from the Forbidden Forest to aid in the Battle of Hogwarts. If you search for this topic online, you'll find many, many instances of fans wishing that the series had brought the car back, if just for a single scene of it going after some Death Eaters in the forest. There seems to be at least a paraphrased opinion from J.K. Rowling that bringing the car back in the final book would have been more than a little absurd, and I can imagine with the pressure of successfully landing the final book in a seven-book global phenomenon, The appetite for throwing in unnecessary callbacks just for the sake of fans was probably pretty low. All that said, I feel like they could have found a way to include it in the movies, even for a brief moment. The stakes were probably a little bit lower at that point. Everyone going to see the movies at that point had definitely read the books, and would have probably loved to see the car make a comeback to save Harry and Ron one more time. But alas, the car is gone in the woods forever. Draco's Redemption In an interview from August 1st, 2006, J.K. Rowling said the following regarding redemption. She was asked about the redemptive qualities of Snape, and then further prompted about the redemptive qualities of Draco. Keep in mind that this interview happened about a year after the release of Half-Blood Prince, and about a year before the release of Deathly Hallows. Quote, So I think I would say my characters, in the main, there is the possibility of redemption for all of them. Draco, I think in Harry's view, even given unlimited time, would not have killed. I assume all of you have finished the book. I don't want to deprive some kid who's got five pages to go. They've been in a coma all this time. Harry believes Draco would not have murdered the person in question. What that means for Draco's future, we'll just have to wait and see. End quote. She's obviously talking about Draco killing Dumbledore, but again, people might not have finished the book by the time she had this interview, so she didn't spoil it. Sorry if I just spoiled it for you. This quote right here has generated a lot of interest in the idea of a redemption arc for Draco. While it's true that Draco never seems to completely go off the deep end, I think it's fair to say that there isn't much of a redemption arc for him there in the series. I would say I also saw comparisons to other works of fiction, like Avatar The Last Airbender, and people mentioning that a redemption arc for Draco was an incredible missed opportunity, and I tend to agree. I feel as though if the author is able to build up a character as a villain for six books and then get me to change my opinion of them in a final book, it's a pretty well-executed redemption arc. That would have been really interesting to see with Draco. Truthfully, this has me wondering more about the HBO show and what will be explored there. 
I doubt this will ever turn into the same type of storytelling as Game of Thrones, but I would love to see a grittier Harry Potter than the PG-rated movies. Hopefully I'm not alone there. Half-Blood Philosopher's Stone And now we get to the bottom of the iceberg with what is probably one of the earliest scenes that J.K. Rowling put down on paper. In fact, she mentions that the scene is about 13 years in the making, but let me back up just a second to give you the context. If you don't remember the opening scene of The Half-Blood Prince, I don't blame you. It's a chapter that is not directly related to really any of the plot points within the greater story, but it does serve a purpose. If you don't remember yet, I'll remind you. It's the scene where the then Prime Minister of the UK is sitting in his office late at night, pondering over his political opponent, the state of his government, how long the week has been, when suddenly his evening is interrupted by Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic. Fudge then has a lengthy conversation with the Prime Minister of Muggles, where he gives him the rundown on all the political issues within the wizarding world, or at least those that might impact Muggle life. You might remember reading this chapter and thinking that it felt a little bit out of place. You can certainly appreciate it in that it connects the wizarding world with the rest of the Muggle world, making it feel a little bit more grounded in reality. However, it's not directly related to anything that will be relevant later in the book. The Prime Minister of Muggles doesn't make a grand reappearance to save the day, so you might also be interested to know that this chapter wasn't always slated to be in the Half-Blood Prince. In fact, J.K. Rowling tried drafts of it in three other books. Quote, I've come close to using a chapter very like this in Philosopher's Stone. It was one of the discarded first chapters, Prisoner of Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix. But here, finally, it works. So it's staying. And that's all I'm going to say. But when you read it, just know that it's been about 13 years in the brewing. End quote. And to dive even further, the actual characters in this original draft were quite different. Fudge, while still a minister, was actually the muggle minister. And instead of him being the one to visit the prime minister, it's actually Rubius Hagrid that barges into Fudge's office to illuminate all the issues that the wizarding world might bring onto the muggle world with an extra special focus on Voldemort. I believe in this draft, the muggle fudge also tries to tell the world about the danger of Voldemort, telling citizens to be on the lookout for a gnome that might try to kill them. All of it is a pretty wide departure from where we ended up. But that's the case with almost all of these. And by all of these, I mean it. We are now at the bottom of the iceberg. If you've made it this far, click that subscribe button for more. Were there cut plot lines that I missed? Let me know in the comments. I think these are some of the most interesting details that go unheard. Lastly, if you're looking for more content, you're in luck. I've got hours of other icebergs on my channel for you to check out. Go take a look. With that, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.